Fair Trade Coffee routinely has images of people who grow coffee and of places where it is grown. In the case of corporate retailers, the information is quite generic. A photo of an unidentified person with a caption that says it is for illustration purposes only. Or just a logo that guarantees a better deal for third world producers. Specialist fair trade brands give much more information, identifying producers, <coughs> benefits and relationships. They detail material advantages to named producers and organisations, often linked to claims about the quality of the coffee in the package. Variations between these notwithstanding, Fair Trade offers two uh, justifications. First, negative ideas about the conditions of growers producing conventional coffee reference such things as disadvantaged farmers in developing countries. The adverse effects of conventional production establish the distinctiveness of fair trade, and unlike the positive outcomes, they are rarely elaborated. The positive outcomes uh, from fair trade take the form of social input into the economy. It is most explicit in the minimum price and the social premium. A leading brand, Cafe Direct, tells us that growers are paid better prices <coughs> and that the company always pays a fair price. Other benefits include investments in roads, schools, medical facilities and community projects. Small farmers are key figures. It is easy for purchasers to imagine such people working their land and taking their produce to market. Small farmers echo common ideas about family, social relationships, communities, and cooperative relations. I think this is misleading, but that does not distinguish fair trade from other companies that make fantastical claims about products. The issue is not whether there are distortions. What concerns me is the nature of the distortion and what is hidden behind the imagined social form. So we go to Costa Rica. Addressing this issue requires understanding contradictions in the operations of fair trade. These contradictions are an outcome of the tension between fair trade's social and political values and market relationships that underpin the production of coffee. We can document these tensions as they are encountered by different sets of people involved in coffee production. In this instance, managers, farmers, and <coughs> workers in Costa Rica. Cooperative managers mediate between the market and the farmers who own the cooperative. This means pay farmers for their coffee, and ensuring that wet processing is carried out efficiently in the cooperative plant. Efficiency means a high percentage of premium coffee and minimising the output of lower grades from the plant. The manager's second area of responsibility is the external marketing of coffee. This requires business strategies trying to sell as much coffee as possible at the highest possible price. To do this, they must juggle between different markets. The attraction of different markets vary according to the quality one is trying to sell and current market prices. Selling all coffee through fair trade outlets is neither an option nor necessarily desirable for complicated reasons I haven't got time to go into. Strategies around selling coffee generate tensions the managers must negotiate. For example, tensions between different producer organ cooperatives competing within markets and tensions with northern fair trade organisations. 
other tensions emerge in relations between managers and farmers. Farmers are not homogenous. One of these people owns over 100 hectares of land. Another has 8 hectares. And the third has just over 2 hectares. All have been members of a small all have been members of a small co-op, small farmer cooperative. The category small farmer tells you no more about the people here than the term householder in the UK tells you whether someone lives in a bedsit or a mansion. Farmers receive direct benefits from fair trade depending on how much coffee they grow which is partly an outcome of how much land they own. Some farmers are active supporters of the cooperative. Others are more critical, saying it swallows the profits. Another problem for farmers is the relations they have with workers. These are workers. Workers harvest coffee and <coughs> some things. They own little or no land. Mostly, they are marginal characters who don't stick around. Unless they have formal or informal work contract or work agreements, they tend to move with the harvest, and they are generally viewed as unreliable, even dangerous. To draw my points together, I have two observations. First, fair trade relies on what we can call ethicality, defined as a moral commentary on the relation between society and markets. The second point is that the moral com commentary has no necessary connection with what happens in coffee production. It might do, but it doesn't have to. It just has to signal to the consumer the possibility of acting ethically and lead them to buy a product and pay a premium on that price. The question flagged for this session is, could and should business save the world? My answer to that question is probably not. Tropical stimulants, coffee, cocoa and tea, for example, are good to dream with to imagine some kind of alternative globalisation based on decommodified direct relations with producers. But like CSR, the main effect is to consolidate power. I don't deny fair trade may have some beneficial effects, but market-driven social justice is mostly just business as usual. Thank you very much. <coughs>